Good morning. And welcome to Vantage Point. We're going to get started this morning with some worship through song. Welcome. And uh, I'm going to turn it right over to Brian and the team. And uh, please join in and worship the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, stand up as you're able and uh, help us to worship in the spirit of the Lord. And... Uh, Welcome your presence here with us.
here today, welcome you into our lives. Sweetest of love 
Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to have your presence here with us, Lord. We thank you this morning for those moments when we can get just a glimpse, just a taste of heaven, Lord. We thank you for your presence here this morning, God. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. We thank you for the way that you bless in our lives, Lord. We thank you for the fact that we can come to you at any time and from any place. We can share our heart's desires with you, Lord. We can share our heartbreaks with you, Lord. And we can share in celebration with you, Lord. I thank you for this people this morning, Lord. I continue to pray for your presence throughout all aspects of the service this morning. I pray for our brother Noel as he comes and speaks to us about the Welcome Home Initiative for veterans. I pray for the children, Lord, as they go out and prepare a special treat for next week for Mother's Day. Lord, I pray as they bring a, uh, a presentation at the beginning of the service next week, Lord, that the kids will be blessed and that the moms will be blessed as a result of what's done there. I thank you for our children's workers, Lord, and uh, the way that you minister to the children through them. I pray your presence be with them as they go out this morning. And uh, Lord, we commit the rest of this service to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So the children are free to go and to work on that presentation for next week uh, for moms. So you want to be here early next week. And I'm Pastor Jeff. I'm one of the uh, pastors on staff here. And Pastor Dean and Pastor Rosalie have been on vacation for a couple of weeks. But I see Pastor Rosalie snuck back this week just to be with the children for that special mom's work. And two weeks ago, Pastor Dean gave a message on From Stress to Blessed as part of the Transform series. And last week, I mentioned that he really took it serious because he was on vacation. Well, that just double that up for this week. He's really serious about this rest thing. That's a little overstatement. I think if we knew exactly what he'd been doing the last two weeks, we'd probably have to slap his hand. But do uh, you know what this is? <laughs> if you've been here the last several weeks, you haven't been able to see, and I meant to mention it before, but this is part of our Transform series. So this is being transformed into a cross right before your very eyes, week in and week out. So. Uh, just keep an eye on that as we as we proceed. And uh, this morning, we're pleased to have Noel Dodd in the, in the prayer uh, to come and to share with us about the Welcome Home Initiative. And uh, Noel's a chaplain, and he's done much work with veterans returning, as I understand it. And uh, he is also kind of extended family here, as he's, uh, I mentioned earlier, he's Toby Dawes' father, if you know Toby, who's usually out of sight up there in the sound booth. Thank you for all your work, Toby. And uh, Noel, I'm just going to let you come and speak to us this morning, and may God stir our hearts as you share. Thank you. Now live. I thought I was alive before. <laughs> you know, I was thinking and about this morning, and I felt rather like the people on an airplane that was flying from England all the way across the small channel that separates the two countries. I think it's called the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, there's a passenger there. I felt a bit like him myself. And I looked out of the wing on the port side, the left-hand side, and I saw the engine smoking and on fire. And then I was looking out of the other side. I could see right the way across. And sure enough, the engine on the other side, both of them, were smoking and on fire. And the plane was beginning to start to go descend. Everybody was getting a bit panicky. And just at that moment, a pilot came out from the front just strapping a parachute on himself and said, don't worry folks, I'm just going for help. 
Well, I feel a little bit like that this morning. I <laughs> feel like I might want to jump off this ship. I'm not usually a preacher, but I know that the Lord is here to help me and help all of us. So just a quick prayer. Lord, be in my heart, in my thinking, in my speaking, and be in all of our listening and understanding. Speak to us now, God, the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to come back in a moment and explain, well, the, the next slide is those. I'm going to explain those in a minute. But I just wanted to say, first of all, and put this in context, the scriptures that I'm going to be looking at today. And the first one that comes up, it's all about encouragement. You talked about transformation and stress, and that's covered in here a bit. But another part of transformation is encouraging one another. And so up there you have... Uh, that verse, and on to the next one, is when the Paul arrived. I thought it was, uh, I think we missed the verse out there, but anyway, Paul said, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. I'm very grateful to Pastor Dean to ask me to come here this morning. It says a lot about a pastor who's willing to trust his church to somebody else who's pretty unknown to him. He's never heard speak before, He's only heard speak over a cup of coffee in a restaurant and to allow me to come and, and, and preach. So my prayer is that there'll be a word of encouragement for each of you, that we will all of us be able to encourage one another and build each other up. And it's all part of that Romans 12 uh, transformation, the living sacrifice, verse 12, verse 1, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship, don't be conformed any longer to this world. Did you hear that, saints? I'm telling you this morning straight from Jesus, do not be conformed any longer to this world. That's the word from the Lord. But renew your mind. Discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, so back to that slide just to briefly say, the slide with the two logos on it, just simply to say that it comes up. I'm just watching through the But it's showing a different slide up there. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> I see. This is one of those churches, is it? <laughs> likes to keep its preachers on the hop all the time. Okay, Just very briefly, the two slides represent two parts of who I am. Uh, I'm a staff member with my wife Meryl. We have been for 20, yeah, 22 years now, nearly 23 years, of an organization called ACTS, that's the left-hand one, which stands for Association for Christian Conferences, Teaching and Service. There's a test at the end, remember it. Okay. Basically, what ACTS does is ministers to military people all around the world, mainly in countries where they don't have a strong Christian presence. They don't have chaplains and so on. So for some years, we were uh, ministering to people in Eastern Europe as they came out of communism. Communism tried to stamp out Christianity, and uh, so we would try to help them. The one on the right, by the way, the role I have now with ACTS is ministry to, as Jeff said, to chaplains and to combat veterans, war zone veterans. The one on the right, it says Anglican chaplains, and that's what this thing is that I'm wearing around here, this ring of confidence, they call it. That's what I call it. Anyway, ring of unconfidence. Um, it's, uh, it's Anglican, and we're, it's the only part of the Anglican church that I know of that actually commissions lay people as chaplains, essentially deacons in the church to go and do the work in the marketplace. Most priests and pastors, they're not exclusively um, uh, not in the marketplace, but they have a church. And I don't have a church that I pastor, like Pastor Dean does or like Jeff does, but I'm out there in the marketplace amongst those veterans and those chaplains. So, moving on just a little bit. I'm former British Army, believe it or not. You'd never tell, would you? Infantry. Um, I'm married. I've got one son up there. I've got two granddaughters here, as you know, and a, and a daughter-in-law, Joanne, lovely daughter-in-law. 
Um, this is our 23rd year in the United States. My other son, his wife, two children are in England. And in 12 days' time, we will have been citizens of this country, this great country, for 14 years. Can't believe that. When we first came here, it was not in our thinking that that would happen. This is something that God has led us in. So as I say, we work now full-time. Well, I think my full-time role, really, at Merrill's is being a popper and a granny, and along with Darlene. <laughs> but really, I'm working full-time in this ministry. I've been away all last week on that. I'm going away on Wednesday for another week. And essentially, what the ministry is, is three things. It's an ear. It's a shoulder, and it's a heart. It's an ear to listen to the other person who I'm talking to, be it a combat veteran or a chaplain. It's an ear to be listening to God at the same time, what God's saying to me about that person. It's a shoulder that a chaplain or a distraught combat veteran can lean on, can get strength from, can cry on, be uplifted and encouraged by whatever purpose that shoulder has for them. And then it's a heart, which I hope and pray is a heart of compassion for them, knowing something about what they suffer and how they suffer because of my own experiences, and being non-judgmental, non-judgmental, and praying for them and showing the love of Jesus to them. A member, Merrill is an integral member of the ministry team. She helps organize the Welcome Home Initiative retreats that we do, and she particularly, in particular, provides quilts. You'll see some photographs of those later on. Above all, she keeps me organized and properly looked after, and I need that. There's no one else in this world who would do that for me. She's an outstanding grandmother, as Charlotte and Lucy know, as is Darlene as well. Meryl is the most unconditionally loving person I know. She must have been to put up with me for coming on 46 years. She's my caregiver as I fight a residual issue from a stem cell transplant I had from a bone marrow cancer four years ago. Nearly four years ago, I was in hospital with this stem cell transplant. And there's a photograph up on the screen now of the donor. That guy Ryan and his wife Beth live in Virginia Beach. We met them about, what, a year ago? Maybe 18 months ago. Had a delightful meeting with them. We spent a whole evening with them, went out for a meal. It was like we had, it was like he was really was meant to be my donor. It was very special. And it was pleasing to us that they are both very active and very committed Christians. But first let me quickly show you a picture of what I used to look like. I haven't got many pictures of me on active duty. I've got a few, but that's one. I don't know if you can see it, probably this. I'm glad you explained about that tree trunk, Jeff. Because I was sitting there thinking, what the heck is that? <laughs> I'm still not quite sure what it is. I'm not sure what it's going to grow into. <laughs> but we used to stand like tree trunks there on those streets in Northern Ireland on anti-terrorist operations. But we used to work closely with the police. That's me in the middle, looking a lot younger than I do now. Uh, that policeman is a police inspector. He's captain, I suppose you'd call him in American terms. The guy on the right is a, one of my officers, a lieutenant, and it's another story, but he saved my life because I listened to him one day instead of going and doing the plan that I was committed to and had decided to. He questioned my plan as I was giving orders. Nobody questions me when I'm giving orders when I'm in the army. They question me before, then question me afterwards in private, but not publicly as I'm giving them. He did. I listened to him. And the bomb that went off a few minutes later just avoided me and my company headquarters by about 10 feet. So thank you to him. That's what I look like there. And here's a photograph of some of the veterans of my regiment in England on a, memorial, on a Veterans Day. That yellow and the black flags there are distinctive 
for the regimental colours of my regiment. The old and bold, we call them. I'm one of the old and bold now. <laughs> and that's on. Could show you lots more. Anyway, so I'm hoping to encourage you today. I'm hoping to send you home as encouragers. I'm hoping to um, uh, encourage you particularly to recommit or commit yourselves to follow Jesus more and more. Just like that Holy Spirit song. Said. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. We want to follow you. We don't want anything else more important in our lives than following you. Doing that work of transformation within our souls, minds, and bodies. I want to tell you three quick stories about transformation with war veterans. I've changed their names, but there are three guys. There are women as well who we've ministered to. They have many different issues. Some are the same issues, especially if they've been involved in a bomb explosion. We've been ministering to a woman who was in the Air Force who was uh, right in the middle of that Oklahoma city bomb. Uh, do you remember that one all those years ago? Long time ago now. The trauma from that is still around, still deeply around. But these stories today are about Steve and Bill and Dave. And they're fictitious names, but they're real people. They all have got war trauma of one sort or another. But interestingly, for two of them, definitely I know, Steve and Bill, I know their trauma started way, way before they joined the military. Their trauma started when they were kids. They had a terrible childhood. I can't tell you how horrible they were. Except that Bill told me that one day he got so um, tired of his father beating him up and assaulting him physically that he got a baseball bat. And he threatened and said to his father when he was 15, said, you touch me once more and I will wallop you with this baseball bat. And I will wallop you so hard I'll kill you. And his father tried to do that. And he tried to kill him. Thankfully he didn't at that time. But he did get a walloping. The other guy, I can't, I can't describe the, the abuse that he had. It wasn't sexual abuse, it was physical abuse. Um, because it's too horrible. But it affected both of them. And so when Vietnam came along, they both joined the military. They didn't wait to be called up and conscripted. They joined. because They wanted to have a bit of control over where they went, which sort of unit they went in. So Steve went to the Marines. He's still a Marine today. He's one year younger than me, just as I'm a British infantry guy. So Steve is a Marine. And Bill is joined the army. Their fathers had constantly told them, you're worthless. You'll never amount to anything. You're a fool. You're stupid. You're useless. As I said, they were beaten. And they felt like failures before they'd even started life. They felt almost guilty to be alive as they grew up. They were continually shamed by their fathers and were ashamed as a result of that. They felt like they were no goods. They both of them saw terrible action. I know their stories. I don't know all their stories, but I know what they've told me. And the stories, I'm afraid, are too graphic to tell you here. They really are graphic. In the one case, in both cases actually, they involved what you might politely call action on their own part, sometimes in orders, response to an order of somebody else, which was extrajudicial. In other words, they took the law into their own hands beyond all of the laws of war, all of the codes of conduct, all of the, in Northern Ireland we had a thing called the yellow card, our terms of reference under which we could engage with fire, with live rounds, and those things all went out of the window. And they came back broken men, because inside they knew that these things, which they did in good faith at that time, or under reaction to the circumstances, they knew instinctively inside, deep down, they had never been born to do those things. So they were pulled apart on the inside, both of them. They came back, 
And for 40 years, they suffered the effects of that. Steve became alcoholic, he became a drug addict, he went into prison, he came out of prison, and he went down and down and down. He was suicidal many times. Somehow, somewhere along the line, he started to come to our retreats about five or six years ago. John, much the same. But for Steve, he started to want to get out of this pit that he was in. It seemed like a bottomless pit. And with our help and with a lot of other people's help, with prayer, but principally with God's help, he started to climb out of the pit, bit by bit. But for about three or four years, every time he got to the top, the edge of that pit that he was in, he was just getting his fingers over the edge to pull himself out. Something happened, often caused by himself, that made him go back into the bottom of the pit. Like if somebody came along and kicked his fingers away. Boom, crash. And each time he went to the bottom of the pit, it was as bad, if not worse, than the worst time he'd ever been there before. But bit by bit, he got out. He got out, and eventually he managed to get out of this pit. It's a figurative pit. It's not a real pit. It's how he felt. He got out of it altogether. And he's now today part of our team. He's still not fully healed. He still has a lot of issues. He still can't walk properly because he's got bullet wounds and frags, fragments of bullets still in his legs. But he's a whole lot transformed and changed from what he was just even five years ago. Part of our team. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the other guy, <coughs> who's Bill actually, <coughs> he was very much the same. But two years ago, he came to one of our <coughs> training sessions, and his intent was to learn. He was a Christian by then. <coughs> his intent was to learn how to pray for others with these sort of things that he got. <coughs> As he was there, we asked for somebody to be a little guinea pig who we could demonstrate a model our prayer technique to. Nothing special or magic about our prayer technique, which is praying with people. But a lot of people are hesitant to do it. And so he came forward, and as we were praying for him and showing the others, this is how we pray, he was transformed. He was taken back in his mind to a particular incident in Vietnam, a horrible, terrible incident. And when we said, you know, Jesus is with you all the time, you didn't even think about him then. You weren't even following him then. But his promise is, I am with you today, yesterday, and forever. And I will never leave you nor forsake you. We forsake him. He doesn't forsake us. So we said, as you are thinking about this particular incident 40 years ago in Vietnam, just look around that situation in your mind's eye and the, with the eyes of your heart. And say, Jesus, where are you? couldn't see Jesus at first. He was looking at his own level in the jungle. He couldn't see. There were too many trees and so on. So then we said, well, if you see a light anyway, look up. Look up above the trees. You have to be very careful not to manipulate people into getting them to do what we want to do in that, in that sort of frame of mind. We tried to just suggest, is, do you think Jesus might be somewhere else in there? And yes, suddenly I could see him above the trees in the light of Christ. And in that instant, it's something I can't explain how, but in that instant, he was healed from the shame, the anger, and so on that he's had. Thank you very much. But in that particular incident, he was transformed. And he keeps telling me, I meet him every 10 days or so now. And he says, you know, going down there two years ago saved my life. I was just beginning to get suicidal. But it saved my life. And that guy, man, in this area, is ministering to other veterans and to other people as well. And he is starting to start a group very soon in the area, uh, probably over at Pine Knoll's Alliance Church, the Potter's House. And we're going to call it the White Star Ministry Group. And we're hoping to get veterans to come to that. Uh, on their terms, not on our terms, we want to be very careful, very sensitive, listen to them. And then we want to use that 
ministry group, not only to see them healed, but to see them come to our retreats, which are several times a year. And those who are on the retreats start coming to this bi-weekly, every two weeks group. So please be praying for that. The third guy I want to talk to you about is a guy called Dan. Actually, sorry, not Dan, Dave. I met this guy five days ago. I was down in Charleston, South Carolina at a chaplain's meeting, and he was there. And I was just talking to him. Never seen him before, never met him before. Turned out he was a, an engineer corps officer from the army. Served in Afghanistan, Iraq. And as we're talking, he's asking me about, well, what's this ministry all about, this healing ministry of the Welcome Home Initiative? So I was telling him, and I wasn't. It was just informational conversation. And just suddenly, almost off the top of my head, but I think it was the Holy Spirit leading me, I said, you know, God can heal. I told him about these two other guys. He heals in those ways. I said, God can even heal people who are down the road in New York, somewhere else in New York State. I can't tell you where it is. I know where it is, but I can't tell you because it's classified. And they're sitting there in an operations room and they've got a, they're playing computer games. Who likes to play computer games? Who likes to use the thumb and whiz the... Are you playing art war games on your computer? Who, anyway, you've got this sort of thumb that goes and directs the little funny men or whatever it might be around. He uh, is directing, these people in this place are directing with a little joystick, drones. Who likes to fly planes? Who wants a drone? Wouldn't it be fun to have a drone? Yeah? So I've got this drone, and I'm sitting there, it's somewhere in New York State, and it actually is controlling a drone that's in Afghanistan. Real time. And that drone is following this car that's going along a dusty road, and this is the car, it's SUV, it's targeted on a terrorist who's driving that, or everybody believes is a terrorist. And so the person gives the command, they say, press the button, presses the button with the thumb, Hellfire missile, bang, the car disappears completely and utterly, so do the people inside. There's nothing left. They then come out at the end of their eight-hour shift, they go home, and they say, oh, hello, darling, oh, what sort of day have you had at work today? Oh, talking to my daughters. How are you doing? How was school today? Daddy, what did you do today? Or mummy, what did you do today? And can you imagine how that rips people apart? The dichotomy, the split of being normal, but being doing something that's highly unusual. And whether it's all justified or not, however much those people are terrorists or not, it is still, we're still brought up to respect human life. And we don't like doing these things, and it tears us apart. And as I was talking about that to this guy today, he just very quietly, we're in the middle of a big crowd of people. He says, that was me. I didn't expect that. He said, I did that, and I did it from the bowels of the Pentagon. I was able to pray with him then. Normally, our prayer, you know, I was talking about modeling it. And I'll show you a slide in a minute of that. It takes a few minutes. On this time, on Monday night, it took like three seconds of prayer. And his whole um, facial um, face and his demeanor and everything just completely changed in three seconds. And we, we went off our respective ways. I saw him on Tuesday morning. I said, how are you feeling? He said, I am so good. I'm feeling so good. He said, it is worth me being coming here to this conference. If nothing else happens in the rest of this week, Last night was worth me coming to this conference. I am healed. I had the best night's sleep I've had in about five or six years last night because he wasn't dreaming about what he's been doing with these joysticks. So those are three stories there. Let's have a look, lighten it a little bit, and have a look at some of the slides now of the Welcome Home Initiative. That's a, just a slide of our group. We usually get about 40 or 50 people there. Many of them, it's about half and half, people who minister and those who are being ministered to. It's very much 
a, um, a one-to-one type uh, ratio. That's how you feel before you come. I just don't know whether I can carry on any longer. And then as they come, each veteran gets a quilt. It's Merrill's part, she organizes that. They don't know that they're going to get a quilt. They only get the quilt on the first time they come. That's uh, three more and two more. You see the, f- the joy on their faces. We've had people wrap themselves up in those quilts and go to sleep and say, I have not had eight hours sleep in 40 years. I had eight hours sleep last night. And there's a ministry, that's us ministering, it's us worshipping actually, in the chapel at the Spiritual Life Centre. I'm going to leave that slide up for a bit, because that's us praying for a vet who came back from Afghanistan, was so distraught that he wanted to commit suicide, and he tried, but he failed, but he shot half his face off. And he's only got half a face, you can't see it very much in that picture. But it's healed a lot, but it's still very disfigured. And we're praying for him. So, what the message is, is as that encouragement and transformation happens to those veterans, it can happen for us, each one of us here today. It's all part of this theme that you have got going. There's a condition on it, though, a little bit of a condition, and that is you've got to want it yourself. That's what these Vietnam vets and the Iraq vets wanted. I'm fed up with this pain, terrible way I'm living, and the horror, these nightmares. I want to to get rid of them. It may not even be terrible stuff like they have. It may be much lesser stuff, the worries and stresses and strains of this world. But you've got to want genuinely to get it off you and hand it over to Jesus. Jesus is the burden taker. He says that, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Give me your burden, and I will exchange your burden for my yoke of rest. Rest is quiet blessing, my peace. It passes all understanding. A peace of heart that transforms our souls enables us to have peace of mind. Remember, he is there all the time. So that's where I'd like to finish up, I think, really, today. It's just to encourage any of you today who are feeling down, depressed, fed up, maybe even worse, to come. I'll be willing to pray for anybody. I don't know if you have prayer teams, Jeff, here, who are willing to pray as well. If anybody wants to come and talk about the Welcome Home, we always need help for the Welcome Home Initiative. It costs about um, 20000 a year to run it, because we give this free to the veterans. But it's our gift to them to say welcome home to them. There are many veterans don't like being welcomed home. When they've had the experiences in Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam that they've had that I haven't told you about, but I alluded to, they don't want to be thanked for that. What are, you, what are you welcoming me home for? I, didn't, I just was engaged in foul stuff. I don't want to be thanked for killing somebody in a foul way. But thank you anyway. But be careful how you say welcome home to a veteran. Not all of them want it. But come and uh, find out more uh, at the end. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sobering talk, isn't it? (laughs) That was pretty serious stuff. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing that with us, though. And uh, it does really fit with the Transform series. Um, You know, these veterans are experiencing war trauma that many of us never see or experience, but uh, all of our lives can bring trauma at different points in time, and God is faithful in all circumstances to be able to bring healing to our hearts and lives. So let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to be here this morning. I thank you for our brother Noel and for the message of hope, really, that he
morning. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you are always there and that you are the ultimate healer, the ultimate provider. Lord, I thank you for uh, the power of prayer that you call us to. And that's what I heard this morning as Noel was speaking to us, Lord, was, you know, lean on me, bring those requests to me. And uh, we thank, for, thank you for your faithfulness in uh, answering our prayers, Lord. May we continue steadfastly in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So there's some refreshments out there. You should have found a connection card, an offering envelope on your chair this morning. Feel free just to drop those in the box on the back wall as you exit. God bless you.